to supporting their cause. Those who didn't became targets themselves. The Russian diplomat, General Mayevsky, wrote, the unarmed Armenian villagers were forced to help the armed rebels at the cost of their blood. Akdamar Island, surrounded by Lake Van, was a major base of operations for the Armenian revolutionaries. From this Armenian church, they masterminded attacks against Muslim villages, provoking them to retaliate. The rebels attacked policemen and other local officials. Their favorite targets were Kurdish villages. Armenians and Kurds had a long history of squabbling over land. This bad blood exploded into violent massacres. The Armenian revolutionaries, sometimes using them, but mainly using their own men from Russia, came in and began to attack Kurdish tribes. Now, why in the world would, say, 30 people attack a large Kurdish tribe? The reason is to spark reprisals. You attack a Kurdish tribe, which is armed, which is dangerous. You kill a number of their people that are off herding sheep. You attack a village that isn't protected at the moment. You do something that will allow you to cause a problem and then to escape. The Kurds were not a people to sit still in the face of provocation. They began to kill Armenians. There was a, a great hostility between Kurds and Armenians in some parts of eastern Anatolia. And when the Kurds were brought into the Ottoman Empire, uh, the military forces of the Ottoman Empire, this created a situation where there was a lot of tension between Kurds and Armenians in eastern Anatolia, which could be used by the central government sometimes for, for their own purposes, the, the purposes of the central Ottoman state, and on other occasions it got out of hand. To the rebels, it didn't matter whether innocent Armenians were being slaughtered. Provocation was their goal. If enough Armenians were killed, then surely Russia would send in its troops. Or Great Britain. Or France. In Istanbul, the Armenian Revolution gained valuable allies. The Armenian patriarchs chief religious leaders of their people. They supported the fight for an Armenian homeland. It was in their best interest to do so. And the Patriarch went on. If you try to set up uh, some kind of national unit, uh, then there will be a horrible backlash from the Turks. So you mustn't do it. Just wait, and nobody will come in to save you, especially not the Russians. They don't like us. No. What is the nationalists' response to their patriarch? They shoot him. The ends continued to justify the means as Armenians took their fight to Istanbul. On August 24th, 1896, a group of Armenian rebels took over the Ottoman bank, chief symbol of the empire's wealth. The incident sparked a riot in the city. About 400 Muslims and 1,700 Armenians died in the violence. Under pressure from Europe, the Sultan pardoned the Armenian rebels, who were granted safe passage out of the country. Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who had been in power for nearly 20 years, was angered by the rebels and their acts of terror, and worried that the great powers might intervene in the situation he ordered his forces to put down the rebellion. The Ottoman army, including Kurdish units known as the Hamidia, launched a merciless attack against Armenian communities. Some of their victims undoubtedly were revolutionaries. Most of them were not. From 1895 to 1897, thousands of Armenians were massacred in eastern Anatolia. These massacres uh, are, were seen as, in a sense, uh, a warning to the Armenians not to organize further and go in the direction that they'd been going before, challenging the Ottoman government and to put aside their uh, demands for reforms, which were feared ultimately would lead to uh, demands for autonomy and independence. In fact, the Hanchakian party's uh, plan did include, uh, ultimately, independence for the Ottoman Armenians. Despite the massacres, 
Armenian rebels such as General Antranik kept up the fight. From 1901 to 1904, his forces attacked and killed thousands of innocent Muslims. Armenian guerrilla forces, portrayed as freedom fighters in the Western press, kept up the struggle against Ottoman rule. In this effort, Christian missions became military warehouses. These uh, missionary schools uh, started to serve uh, like um, uh, fortresses uh, for the Armenians. Uh, they uh, were able to hide their arms, ammunitions in these schools and uh, receive orders uh, from uh, their uh, leaders, from the uh, Revolutionary Committee leaders through these schools. As the great powers moved closer to war, Armenian revolutionaries changed their strategy. The focus shifted from provocations against Muslims to the procurement of arms and ammunition. When war finally did come, the rebels would be ready to help the enemies of the empire. One will find a lot of information and documents on the role of Russia, Great Britain, and France in Armenian rebellions in Anatolia. Their role in organizing and arming Armenian revolutionary bands, forming brigades of Armenian volunteer fighters who they let fight against the Ottoman army. In 1908, radical change swept across the Ottoman political landscape. On July 23rd, the Sultan was forced from power by the Committee of Union and Progress, a coalition of reform-minded politicians and military leaders. The Empire's constitution and parliament, suspended since 1876, were both reinstated. Once again, Ottoman citizens could participate in elections governed by a constitutional monarchy. The parliament passed legislation for political, social, and economic reforms. Even the Armenian Tashnak party agreed to cooperate with the new government in Istanbul. Perhaps political autonomy could be achieved without the use of terror. But reform movements were set aside in Istanbul when the Balkan Wars broke out in October of 1912. Greece, Serbia, and Bulgaria marched against the Ottoman Empire, invading its territories in Europe. Thousands of Muslims were killed or driven out of southeastern Europe as the Balkan armies advanced. A great mass of refugees from the theater of war flowed into the empire. In a horrific prelude to World War I, the Balkans were torn apart by combat, famine, and massacre. In Istanbul, another political force had been gaining momentum, the Young Turk movement. It supported the empire's military leaders, and the Ottoman government became a dictatorship in early 1913, led by a triumvirate of men. Minister of War, Enver Pasha. Minister of Interior, Talat Pasha. And Minister of the Navy, Cemal Pasha. Under their rule, social and political reform continued, even as the empire drew closer to its own demise. The head of the Armenian national delegation, Bogos Nubar, still managed to negotiate some reforms for the Armenian people. But these promises were shattered by the outbreak of World War I. In August 1914, the war that Europe had been waiting for finally arrived. Great Britain, France, and Russia lined up against